Hi, my name is Sarish Sudhakaran and in this video, I'll explain what a waveform monitor is and how to read one. In order to learn how to expose, you must know your camera. Modern cameras come with either log curves or other flat or cine profiles that don't have to correspond to Rec. 709. However, thankfully, they give us the numbers we want so we can compare their curves with Rec. 709. For example, S-Log2 is a log curve from Sony. Black falls at 3 IRE, middle gray falls at 32 IRE, 90 IRE white falls on 59 IRE. 100 IRE can go all the way into the super whites area. Canon C log is similar. Airy log C and Sony S log 3 are similar. And manufacturers make specific recommendations for exposure based on the log curve used. So it would be wise of you to study and understand them thoroughly. I know this must seem overwhelming, so let's take baby steps. Say you have a camera and a waveform, what next? I suggest the simplest way to learn to expose with your camera is to start with the DSC Labs one-shot chart, or any other color chart, or even a grayscale chart, doesn't matter, as long as it has a calibrated and carefully printed white, black, and middle gray patch. The next thing you need is a tungsten light source. Halogen works great too. Basically, you need something that emits a constant radiation. If you can't use tungsten, you can also use a high-quality LED or a fluorescent tube to get the job done. But avoid daylight because it changes fast, even when you think it's not. Point your camera at a scene and you should see your waveform represented. For now, let's think of the waveform you see as an amoeba, a shape-shifting organism. Let's say you want to change its shape, but not too drastically. Remember, you can't change the width because that's determined by the width of the image. There are basically only five ways you can do it. Pull down its pants, lift it by the scruff, raise it entirely, squeeze it or stretch it vertically in either direction, and finally, let it keep its outward shape but change it inside. What do I mean by all this? Here it is. Pulling down the bottom is how you manipulate the shadows and blacks. On professional cameras, the settings that help you do this are normally called the black level or pedestal and the black gamma, etc. The setting that helps you do the same to the highlights is the white level, knee, sometimes gain. This is different from the gain setting or ISO setting, which tackles sensor sensitivity. Raising it entirely is changing the brightness setting. Squeezing or stretching it is changing the contrast. What is contrast? It is the difference between black and white. If there's a big gap between them, it's high contrast. If the gap is low, it's low contrast. That's why log curves look flat or washed out. The difference between the white and black regions is small. Finally, keeping its outward shape but changing the inside is my cute way of saying change the gamma of a curve. If you have a waveform monitor and camera handy, play with these settings and observe your scene, both on a display and on a waveform. If you have a grading application or NLE, open up the waveform scope inside it and try the same. By now, you shouldn't be surprised to learn they all work the same way. In a grading application, similar tools exist. Lift gamma gain is nothing but moving the pedestal, which is lift, moving the highlights, which is gain, and changing the innards, which is gamma. In addition, you'll see brightness and contrast as separate tools as well. See how one puny waveform is your lifeline from camera to post? and it's the one constant tool that bridges your entire workflow. So are you ready to learn how to expose your camera now? Then here are the steps. When you first get a new camera, you point it at a color or grayscale chart and shoot Rec. 709. Observe the image and the waveform, and note it all down. Take photos with your mobile phone so you can refer to it. Then bring the footage into an application that also has a waveform scope and see if it matches. Most times, it should. Finally, try to watch your footage on a calibrated broadcast monitor. If that's not available, use the software to simulate an approximate view. If such a setting does not exist in your software, it does it automatically most likely. Rec. 709 is easy for most displays to show. Now, if your camera has a log curve, try to find a published document from the manufacturer that helps you understand its unique characteristics. If you're not prepared to study the published documents, don't shoot log, period. Now shoot the same chart under the same lighting conditions and see what it looks like. Expose for middle gray using a spot meter. Does it lie where the manufacturer said it will lie? 
Good. Record the scene and bring it into your editing or grading application. Does the waveform still look normal? Sometimes it won't, but Google around for reasons why because it most likely is not your fault. Sometimes softwares don't play nice. Now think of the log image as our amoeba. You want to manipulate the five settings on your grading tool to get it to look like the chart shot under Rec. 709. Move the pedestal first, then the gain, finally you might have to tweak the gamma or contrast a bit. But with these steps, you should be able to make them look very close. With this exercise, you will see how the log curve helps preserve highlight and shadow detail so you have more options in post-production. Repeat the same steps for actual real-world scenes. Shoot under challenging conditions like windows in the background, specular highlights, underexposed areas and so on. And of course, don't forget the most important subject of all, a human face. Look at how these curves represent skin tones. Do you like what you see? Does it look natural? Is your goal that it should look natural? Or flattering? Or maybe ugly? If you're shooting for the internet or DCI, should you restrict your whites to 100 or should you shoot all the way to 109, if the camera allows you that is? And then rework everything in post. Or are you shooting broadcast and you need to keep white at 90 IRE? Well then keep white at 90 IRE. Make your decision. Learn to overexpose and underexpose your images using both charts and test scenes. Repeat this study until you find the breaking points of your camera. What are these breaking points? Here are a few examples. Noise levels, especially ugly color noise. When do they appear and why? Highlight roll off. When do they start to look ugly and why? Crushed blacks. When do blacks get crushed and why? Skin texture and tone. How much can you over or underexpose and still retain good skin tones? What kind of information are you trying to gather? Here's a list. Try to isolate ISO groups. For example, if a camera has a base ISO of 800, then it might have similar noise characteristics to ISO 3200. Beyond that point, the noise increases significantly. Maybe 6400 and 12800 ISO are similar, and so on. How does this help? Imagine you're shooting someone against a window and then suddenly you want to film the reverse shot with a strong backlight. If you expose one frame for ISO 12800 and the other for ISO 800, they will not match in post. Next, understand when to preserve highlights and when to let things blow out. Our eye actually blows out bright windows and objects when we have to concentrate on a part where there is less light. Our eye can see a total of 30 stops of dynamic range but not at the same time. At the same time, we can probably do 20 stops, and modern cameras are getting close to that. If you want to know if a scene has elements blown out, a quick glance at the waveform will tell you so. When you cross 109, the graph will flatten out. If your project is in studio swing, the graph might flatten out at 100. Shoot gradations on walls or smooth surfaces and see how the tonality is affected. Observe what that looks like on a waveform. What you're looking for are patterns. Recognizing and remembering these patterns will make it much easier for you in the field when you're under tremendous pressure to nail the shot. There are tons of things you can do with a waveform, but I'll wrap up with two cool examples that might not be very obvious. First, if you're lighting a face, you'll want to know the contrast ratio. This one's different from the display. It's a difference in light levels from one side of the face to the other. You could walk up to your talent and meter both sides using a light meter. Or, you could take one glance at your waveform and know how many stops they are apart. Imagine if there are four actors in the scene, which method is faster? The second cool technique is while lighting chroma keys or solid backgrounds. You can meter each corner to get the right exposure. Or, you could take one peek at the waveform to know if your lighting is spot on or what you need to fix. If the line is thin, the levels are fine vertically. If the line is straight, the levels are fine horizontally as well. If the line is above middle gray, you probably have enough saturation to pull a decent key. A faster and more useful exposure tool, there is none. With practice, you will learn where to keep skin tones on the waveform for most pleasing results. Remember, it's not a mathematical exercise, and it is not exposing by formula. If I like to expose skin at a certain IRE, you shouldn't copy it. That would be the height of stupidity. Skin tones differ across the globe, 
and lighting conditions also change skin brightness and texture greatly. If you start exposing by numbers, you will soon arrive at a situation where it will fail you and you will have failed the project. There are some conventions of exposing skin tones, but I will not tell you what they are. It's not important. If you do the tests as I've explained them, you will arrive at what works for you, and that will work for everybody. The rewards for this exercise is a solid understanding of your camera's limits. You'll know when not to push and when not to under or overexpose. You'll know when not to touch the pedestal or knee or gain, when to stop bumping up the ISO and so on. And guess what? This entire exercise should not take more than a full day if you plan it correctly. Except for a color chart, it requires no other expensive tools or props. Invest in a color chart and a waveform monitor. When buying a waveform monitor, try to buy one that does both HDMI and SDI, and one which can accept as many signal types as possible so it's future-proof. Well, congratulations, you have just learned to expose your camera. In case you weren't listening, here it is once again. Exposure is the art of fitting the scene to the display. It's an art. There's no correct exposure for anything. There's only what you like to see at the end on a display. If you're happy, that's correct exposure. Many cinematographers say learning photography helps in understanding video, but I think it's not completely true anymore. I say anymore because when everyone shot film, a lot of the skills overlapped. I'm talking about exposure skills. Today with Photoshop and high dynamic range imaging, many photographers who start shooting video try to use the same exposure tools for both. That is being inefficient and lazy. What's the difference between photography and video when it comes to exposure? For one, video is a succession of shots, and each shot must match the previous and next shots in exposure, noise, motion, and color. A slight change is usually undetected, but large changes in exposure or color are easily detected even by laypersons. Tools like a camera meter or histogram fail miserably here, because they will not help you match shots. One example of the inadequacy of a histogram is when shooting raw, there's a popular exposure methodology among still shooters called ETTR, or exposed to the right. I've already talked about it elsewhere, so I won't go into detail about it here. But the fundamental principle is, overexpose until just before something clips. The goal is to preserve your highlights, as if you can sell your highlights for cash by the kilo. The advantage of ETTR is that you can get the cleanest image possible on a digital sensor. But for video shooters, it has four major disadvantages. First, if you shoot many shots of the scene days apart and the exposure changes, you will expose each shot differently. When you bring them into post, you must spend extra time trying to get them to match exposure. See the problem here? You're exposing twice. You're doing the same job twice. If you only use the right tools in the first place, you'll have correctly exposed shots already and you can go to the next step. The second disadvantage is more important, and that is the havoc specular highlights cause. On a regular shoot, a camera person is under pressure to get the shot. If a particular shot has a specular highlight like a light bulb or a reflection of a car and so on, it will be drastically underexposed compared to the other shots. The third main disadvantage appears when you use multiple cameras and the other two don't shoot raw. How do you match exposure on all cameras? Some of you watching this video might wonder, what's the big deal? Let's say we screwed up and exposed to the right. We can still correct things in post. Well, not exactly. This is where noise levels becomes a problem. Noise is always present in an image, but it is more visible in underexposed regions. If you underexpose to save a specular highlight, the important parts of your scene, most likely human skin, will be underexposed beyond the sweet spot of the sensor. Or at least, not in the same ISO group. When you bring this level up in post, the noise is brought up too, and the face will no longer match the shots that went before or after it. Now do you see the problem? And finally, the fourth main disadvantage. If every shot is to be exposed differently, then how do you light a scene consistently? For video, it is extremely important to maintain a consistent level of exposure. If you test the camera to find its limits, you will never make the stupid mistake. When faced with a scene that demands you make some compromises, you'll know exactly whether the compromise is worth it or not. 
Otherwise, you'll either shoot what you get if time and money is short, or have the wisdom to shoot in better lighting conditions. That's what cinematography is all about. That's how you always stay in control. That's how you fit the scene to the display, no matter which scene and no matter which camera is given to you. Therefore, be careful when shooting raw. The smart way is to learn how to use your waveform and expose for it once. You treat raw footage like any other footage. You start with the display and work backwards. If you're feeling inadequate, learn to use LUTs. That's about it. This has been a fairly long video, but I hope you're convinced that a waveform monitor isn't that complex at all. In fact, it's the neighbor whom you should befriend immediately because this neighbor will help you expose any scene, any camera, any time. The waveform monitor has survived many formats and many cameras and is still around stronger than ever. Learn to love it. Visit your nearest waveform monitor dealer today. Only while stocks last.